Well, praise the Lord. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for allowing me and Brother Thomas to be here po. Ako po si Micah. And that is all my Tagalog po. Uh, so, I am sorry po. There's, I, I am a Phil Am. And so, uh, not much Tagalog here. So, it's going to run out eventually po. But I will try my best to throw out Tagalog words. And if, you, if it's wrong, correct me, okay? Pastor, say, Pastor Micah, that's wrong. That's wrong Tagalog. You're butchering our language. Okay, so you're, you have my, uh, my um, you can do that for me, okay? I want to learn while I'm here, all right? Joshua keeps speaking English to us, and so <laughs> we can't learn if he keeps talking English to us. So, so I'm sorry, when you sent Josh to us, we turned him into an American paw. <laughs> so I'm sorry. Sorry, Tito George. Sorry, Tito Ovi. He's, got, he's, he's American now, so he's ours. So, okay, so I have the privilege, Paw, to um, take us in our study to... The Psalm 133, Paul. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Psalm 133, Paul. Now, I know you are going through uh, parables. Is that correct, Paul? Is that for, uh, for this uh, Bible study? And so uh, this is not a parable, Paul, but it is a psalm. A psalm about unity, a psalm about being with God's people. And so I will read for us Psalm 133, and then we will start our study together. Psalm 133, the word of the Lord says this, a song of ascents of David. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. It is like precious oil upon the head, coming down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, coming down upon the edge of his robes, it is like the dew of Hermon coming down upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forever. And God's people say, Amen, Amen. You know, when I was a kid, Paul, I never liked doing chores. I hated doing the dishes. Um, the dishes were always very hard for me, Paul. I, I didn't like washing, uh, getting my hands wet, and so I would use gloves. Um, it was okay to wash the, yung, uh, the metal, uh, you know, tenedors, right? That's okay. The metal forks and spoons, uh, the, the, the big wooden spoons. Every Filipino has a big wooden spoon, de right, And so uh, I, I had no problem washing those things. But the, the, the ceramic bowls, the glass cups, why was I scared to wash those things? Because I broke them, right? I broke them all the time. They would slip out of my small hands. I have big hands now, but like, like Kuya Peter. But I, I, uh, I, have, I had small hands as a kid, and so they would always break. And so when we look at ceramic bowls and, 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 and glass cups, I, I didn't like to wash them because they're easily what? Breakable. There are some things in this world that are easily broken. There's, there's uh, glasses. There's ceramics. There's a lot of things that are easily broken in this world. And when it comes to the church, there's also something easily broken. It's unity. Unity is easily broken in the church. For example, in the U.S., we fight a lot. You know that. You see that over on the news. You hear about us in America fighting over everything. We fight over hymns versus worship songs. We fight over uh, homeschool versus public school. We fight over uh, food to provide. You know, there's one Phil M church in, uh, next to us. Um, they're a Filipino church, and they provide food in, during fellowship. And uh, they made an announcement at church, and they said, and they were kind of angry. They said, you are eating too much pandisal. You need to save the pandisal for other people. And so they stopped serving pandisal during fellowship. Because the pandisal was even breaking the unity of the church. Pandisal! Can you believe it? Unity in the church is easily broken. And uh, many people leave the church, right? Many people, um, um, ramming excuses, right? There, there are a lot of different excuses. Uh, there's no youth ministry. Um, the preaching is too long, right? Pastor Peter preaches too long. Uh, Pastor Peter's too tall, right? There's a, they pray too much. You know, someone looked at me the wrong way. You know, there, there are so many reasons why people leave the church and conflicts happen. We see the same people, same pastors, same routines. But we're, we're different people, right? We're, we're different people all under the Lord. And some people think it's easier to be by yourself. 
you know, we have an expression in the U.S. Um, we call people uh, uh, lone wolves, right? Wolves, they, they travel by themselves sometimes. Not always in packs. Sometimes wolves can go by themselves. And so people who are, live by themselves, they are called lone wolves or lone rangers. Um, pero in, in the Bible, there is no such thing as a lone wolf Christian. Right? No such thing as a lone wolf Christian. When we look at the Bible, when we look at the salvation and the Lord Jesus Christ, when Jesus Christ saved us, he saved us to not be by ourselves, but be to, to be part of a bigger body, a, a bigger corporation, a, a bigger um, project or bigger uh, circumstance than, than just us. And so... Here, the New Testament, even in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, warns of forsaking the fellowship. Right? It says, uh, stimulate each other to, to love and good deeds, and do not forsake the what? fellowship. Do not forsake the fellowship. And so, Psalm 133 uh, talks about the joys of being with God's people. If you do not enjoy being with God's people, um, this psalm is for you. All right? Uh, good thing we're talking about joy. We are in Jolly Bee. And so <laughs> it is fitting for us to talk about Jolly Bee and the joy of being with God's people. And so this is applied to our regular fellowship with God's people. The Song of Ascents were sung by the Jewish pilgrims as they would go up to Jerusalem. Uh, they, they would be celebrating these things called annual feasts. Po. And these were holidays. It's like Christmas. It's like Thanksgiving for them. And so they would come back and they would see uh, old familia, right? Old relatives. They would see their, their batchmates, right? People they haven't seen for a long time. They would climb all the way back to Jerusalem, traveling miles and miles and miles in the heat. I think it's still humid in, in Jerusalem, like the Philippines. I think it's humid there. Uh, and so they would, they would walk. There's no aircon at that time, right? No aircon. And they would go so far just to be with God's people. Wow. And David writes this during an unknown time where he reflects upon the unity of God's people. And, and David experienced what it was like to be uh, not unified with God's people. If you remember, his son tried to kill him. Uh, his whole, the whole nation was against him. And so David knows what it's like to, uh, to experience disunity. And so he talks about how the, the, the joy and the pleasure that comes from the unity with God's people. And so this is a fitting psalm for, 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 the, for the Jewish person to meditate on before he goes up uh, to Jerusalem. This is also a good psalm to meditate on before Bible study. A psalm before Sunday gathering, before you go to festival, right? A good psalm to, to meditate on before you, you come together because it reminds you of how good and joyful it is to be with God's people. Uh, we're going to see this in four parts. Unity brings happiness. Unity brings harmony. Unity brings health. And unity brings heaven. Ah, very smart, huh? I'll start with H. Very good. So that's my MDiv. They all start with H, all right? See, Josh, he will do that as well for you, okay? Unity brings happiness. Verse 1, behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell in unity. David starts off the psalm by saying, what? Behold. What's behold in Tagalog? Tingnan mo, po, right? <laughs> What's behold, right? But we don't say behold a lot. Behold, you don't even say that in, in, in the States. And so David is, is using this word behold to, to call attention to, to what follows. You know, um, uh, my daughter, she is three years old, Pa. And she, everything fascinates her, you know. She'll stack blocks, her toy blocks, and she'll say, Papa, look, Papa, look. I'm like, okay, I have to look at the blocks now. And she'll be outside, and she shows me a bug like an ipis. Papa, look, a cockroach or ipis. I don't want to see that, but I have to go look, right? Because as a three-year-old, everything is beautiful. She wants, she's so excited. She just wants me to see everything. And so she says, look, look. And that's what David says. He is so excited, so happy. He wants us to see in verse 1 what he is going to talk about. And what is that? Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for what? For brothers to dwell in unity. He says, I want you to see how good unity is. 
He uses the word good. And we are familiar with this word good. We see this word in Genesis chapter 1. You remember Genesis chapter 1, Paul? When God created uh, all the different um, uh, things of the earth. He, 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 he created the, the, the sun and the moon, uh, the animals, the people, the vegetation, the land and the water. He said after day one, he created it. And then he said it was good. Day two, he created. And after that, he said it was good. And so forth. As he says it is good, he, he, he uses the same word, not to reference the creation of the world, but to reference unity. Unity. He says, this is good and pleasant. He says, it is how good, oh, how good and pleasant it is for brothers to dwell in unity. That word uh, pleasant also has been used in Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 6, to um, describe the appearance of, the, of your spouse, yung uh, asawa po. Right? The, uh, do you, yeah, husbands, I know you say that all the time to your wives. Right? And so uh, uh, if not, you're supposed to. Right? We're supposed to say that all the time. And so the appearance of the spouse is pleasant. In, in the same way, uh, in Psalm 81 verse 3, the same word is translated sweet to refer to the sweet sound of a song. You know, your, your radio stations in here in the Philippines are weird. All right? uh, they're different because they're 20 years old. They're, they're playing old songs from the 80s, the 70s. And so there, I, they, it takes me back because I, well, I wasn't born then. I wasn't born in the 70s. But they're, they're all sweet-sounding songs. And so when I see Josh and I see him like a song, I see him just, you know, just it's a sweet melody, right? That's what happens when you like a song. It is pleasant. It is sweet to the ear. And he says that is the same word being used. In the same in, uh, word used in Psalm 135 verse 3 where it describes God's name. God's name is, is described as lovely. But it's not describing the appearance of your spouse. It's not describing the sweet sound of a song. It's not describing even the name of God. What is pleasant describing? Unity. It is both good and pleasant for brothers to dwell together in unity. The main point here, Paul, is that it is, there is joy in being together with God's people. It brings great pleasure. And we are called to preserve the unity in terms uh, of, of, of what we are supposed to do. If you look at Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, Paul. Let me read this for you. Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 3, uh, talk about the importance of preserving unity. And it says, Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love. Be diligent to preserve the unity in the, of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, one spirit, just as you are called in one hope of your calling. Verse 3 says we are called to preserve or protect our unity in the Lord. Uh, the verse says protect, not create, meaning that the unity is already here. It is already existing. It's our job to protect and preserve. I am what they call a Phil-am, a Filipino-American. But when I'm in America, I'm more American than I am Filipino. And so I have to fight to keep my Filipino alive. I have to try to speak Tagalog with my poor Tagalog. Um, I have to try to keep eating the, the same uh, you know, the Filipino foods because if I, if I don't try hard to preserve my, my Filipino, my American comes out more and it dominates my Filipino. And I have to preserve it. But it's there. I, I'm Phil Am, right? It's there. It's in my blood. I look Chinese, but I'm Filipino. It's there. But I have to preserve it or else it's going to go away forever. The same is true for unity. Unity exists. It's there. It's present in God's people. But you have to protect it. You have to preserve it. You have to, you have to cultivate it or else it will be prone uh, or subject to falling. And so there are many enemies to unity. There's conflict. There's sin. Other people's sin, our own sin. Um, bad doctrine. Uh, people's preferences. And so here we are here to... Um, to, to protect unity 
And this is what maintains our joy in verse 1, uh, where we can see that it is good and pleasant for us to dwell in unity. How do we maintain joy, Paul? It is we remember the gospel identity as part of the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12 says that. We are united as one body in Christ. Ephesians 4, 1 through 3 says, we tolerate our preferences and differences, Paul. Um, the small things uh, we, we tolerate. Philippians 2, 3 through 4, we look at the interests of others first rather than ourselves. We are others focused rather than ourselves. And God will give us uh, joy in this type of fellowship. Will you uh, join together in fighting for unity, Paul? Will you fight for it? Number two, unity brings harmony. Uh, please look at verse 2. It says, It is like the precious oil upon the head, coming down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, coming down upon the edge of his robes. And so here, the, uh, uh, um, King David begins to use two pictures, Paul. Two pictures of unity. The consecration of oil and the, the dew from, from Mount Hermon. So here, this type of oil, Paul, is not the same oil you use to fry bangus, okay? This different oil. Um, to fry your langunesa, that's not the oil here, okay? This oil is a fragrant oil. This type of oil was, was used for a special type of blessing. It was sweet. It was pleasant. It was beautiful. And so the emphasis here, Paul, is on how, how the oil is used, okay? The, the oil here is a very strange picture. It, says, it is like precious oil upon the head coming down the beard. That's weird. It's vivid and weird. Because uh, do Filipinos have beards? Eh, sometimes, right? Sometimes. Uh, in America, Paul, we don't have beards in, uh, for Filipinos, so, especially me. So uh, I, don't, I cannot relate to this, Paul. I don't understand. Um, but here, the picture is the oil goes from head down to the toes through the beard. And this was not any type of beard, Paul. It was uh, a priestly type of beard where they would grow down side locks, growing down uh, from the side. And here, it's not just anyone's beard, but whose beard? Aaron's beard. Aaron's beard. And who was Aaron, Paul? Aaron was the high priest of Israel. He was the high priest of Israel. And this might be referring to Aaron's con consecration in Exodus chapter 29 or Leviticus 9, where the tribes of Israel were around the tab uh, tabernacle. And Aaron use, was used maybe to represent all Israel. Aaron was a representative of all Israel. And that's why he is uh, referenced here today in, in this text. And it says, the oil is going down Aaron's beard, coming down in great quantities. It's coming down, running down uh, like a waterfall. Uh, there's waterfalls here in the Philippines, right? Um, and so waterfall, like a, in terms of, of a waterfall of oil in the Hebrew, it's a continuous action, meaning there's, there's lots and lots and lots of oil, a big abundance and this signifies the union of God's people, meaning in totality from top to bottom, all of God's people are drenched or drowned in this sweet fellowship. See, the oil represents unity, and all of them from every tribe, every, every region, every social spectrum, every person is, is, is united and gathered for one purpose, that is to worship the Lord. And the church is made up of many people, right? The church is made up of the poor. Uh, the church is made of the, the, the squatters. The, the church is made of the, the type A uh, or the, the class A social class. Um, and so from A to E, the church is filled with many different people. And he says, it doesn't matter who you are. From top to bottom, unity covers everybody. Doesn't matter what age, young or old. Doesn't matter how you look, pangit or beautiful, right? Doesn't matter who you are. Unity covers everybody. And this is what the beautiful part about the gospel. The gospel is without discrimination, Paul. It, it is for everyone. The gospel unity is for everyone. And Filipinos, you know, we're used to this. We embrace uh, family, right? We, we, we love family. Do Filipinos love family? Filipinos love family, right? And so we... When I, when, we, when, my, when I drive with my dad, Paul, I, 
You know, my, my, my dad will, 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 I'll be driving him around our, our, our streets, and sometimes he'll say, Micah, look over there. That's your tito. Oh, that's my tito. I've never seen him before. Said, Micah, look over there. That's your nino. Pa, I don't even know who that is. I said, who is that? How, would, how are we related? That's my cousins, brothers, uncles, first sons, cousin, twice removed, daughter-in-law, whose friend I went to college with. It's like, wow, we're related to everybody, right? And so we, we as Filipinos, we, we appreciate family, right? We appreciate family. But this is something closer than blood. This is, this is a union that is through Yahweh. Union through Yahweh. How do I know this? Mark chapter 3, verses 33 to 35. Let me read this for you, Paul. Mark 3, 33 to 35. If you remember, Jesus uh, was doing ministry, and they said, oh, your, your, your nana is here, Jesus. Your, 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 your siblings, your brothers and sisters are here. And he answers and says, verse 33, he said, Who are my mother and my brother? Looking about as the, uh, those who were sitting around him, he said, Behold, my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. He says, Behold my family, those who do the will of God. And so we as Filipinos, as, as great as blood family is, this is better. As good as our brothers and sisters are by blood, this is better. Because this is stronger than blood. This is unity in Christ. This is unity in the gospel. I love, beloved, I, I have not met uh, most of you. But I, I have this union with you, even though you have not met me before, Paul. Why? Because we are united by Jesus Christ, even though you have not met me. Beautiful. A beautiful truth of the gospel where unity brings such harmony. Number three. Unity brings health. Who likes to be healthy, Paul? Anyone trying to be healthy? Trying to eat less white rice? Less kanen, right? See, Josh, he's trying to eat less rice. Um, we tried brown rice um, at my home. I told my wife, no more. No more. No more. No more. I'd rather be unhealthy than do brown rice. So, you know, we, we try to be healthy. We try to exercise. And, um, you know, this, this, this point here in verse 3a is talking about how unity makes us healthy Christians. It says, it is like the dew of Hermon coming down upon the mountains of Zion. Mountain dew, right? You drink mountain dew, right? This is different mountain dew, Okay. Mount Hermon is the highest mountain in Israel, several miles north of Jerusalem. What's the highest uh, mountain in the Philippines, Paul? Is it uh, Mount, uh, Mount Apo, right? Is that the highest one? I looked it up earlier. So, <laughs> Mount Apo is about 9,691 feet. I don't know what it is in sa kilometers, Paul. I, I'm still in feet because I'm an American. So, 9,691 feet. Um, Mount Hermon is 9,000. 232. So just a little bit under Mount Apo, right? But it is the biggest, highest mountain, highest elevation uh, in Israel. And here, because of the high elevation, there's a lot of what? Moisture. A, a lot of rainfall. So Mount Hermon. And so here, the rain and even snow would, would fall on Mount Hermon. And from the, from the top of the mountain would flow streams of water coming down because of all the moisture. And even in the morning, there would be a lot of moisture coming in the form of dew coming all the way down to Israel. And so it would start to give this abundance of, of vegetation and greenery. And it would provide uh, this refreshment to Israel. Uh, because of its, 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 uh, it was so close to Mount Hermon. Uh, and this is a beautiful picture because the dew brought life to Mount Zion. Mount Zion was where Jerusalem was, right? Mount Zion is where Jerusalem was. And, and so it brought this type of refreshment. And, and this represents that, the fact that fellowship brings refreshment to God's people. Um, do you like being refreshed, Paul? 
you know, we have Goldilocks in the Philippines as well, Paul. All right? And so I like getting the calamansi juice, it's a Goldilocks. It's good, especially on a hot summer day. Um, when you get, even the Philippines, Paul, when you just get, you drink, it's a hot day. See, it's, it's only, what, February, right? Let's wait for March. Okay, it's March. And you've got a nice cold glass of calamansi juice. And then you drink and drink and drink. And then what do you say afterwards? Ah like the Sprite commercials, right? Ah, that's the idea of refreshment, right? Hot day, but you drink a very nice, refreshing, cold drink of water. That type of refreshment is what David uses to describe unity. That when you are with God's people, it is like drinking a cold glass of water in the Philippines. Ah. It's refreshing to be here. It's refreshing to be here on the second floor of Jollibee with you, right? I am encouraged. I am refreshed. I am renewed. And it's so beautiful because this refreshment is, is all throughout the New Testament. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 18, Paul, it says, Paul was refreshed by certain believers who refreshed others. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 16, Onesiphorus was a man who was refreshing. And he uses, in verse 3, a poetic device to talk about Mount Hermon, the big mountain, and Mount Zion, the small mountain, uh, talking about two opposites that express wholeness, the big and the small. You know what that means? That unity, refreshment in unity is for everyone. Salahat, right? It's for everybody. Refreshment is for everyone because, beloved, there are some people in the church that think they do not need fellowship. There are some in the church that think they do not need the church. And so you'll see them only once a month at festival, once a year at Jollibee. You will rarely see them because they think that they do not need refreshment. Um, and that's sad because... Uh, we know that we have difficult weeks. We know we have trials. We struggle with sin. The attitude is, I need this refreshment. I need to be with God's people. I am spiritually parched. I am spiritually dry. And the only thing that will refresh me is being with God's people. Loved ones, do you, be, do you feel like that? Do you have that sense of urgency and desire to be with God's people where you are thirsty throughout the week and all you want to do is be with God's people? That's a spiritual thirst that we need. Another application, Paul, is do you refresh? Are you refreshing to other people? Or do people avoid you? Are you what they call a downer? Huh? Are you so depressing that when people see you at Jollibee, they go to Makdo instead? <laughs> Right? Uh, are you such a downer where I have, uh, Brother Josh and I have this pre preaching professor. His name is Dr. Montoya. He said this of preaching, but it, it applies to fellowship. Instead of raising the dead, you kill the living. <laughs> is that you today? Is that us today? We really need to evaluate ourselves, Paul, if we are actually refreshing other people. We want to spiritually rejuvenate others in united fellowship. Last one, number four, Paul. Unity brings heaven. Unity brings heaven. Look at the second half of, of, of verse three. It says this. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forever. David closes the psalm by addressing the blessing that comes from harmonious fellowship. He says, this is where the blessing is. It's there. Um, it refers to unity. Uh, the place of blessing, that is the location. If you want to know where blessing is, he says it's there. The blessing is there where brothers to dwell together in unity. David uses the word command. Uh, he uses the word command to refer to sending the blessing. That word is a military term, Paul. Um, I don't know if it's the same in the Philippines, Paul. Is Duterte the commander-in-chief of the army? Okay. Same way the, with, with Donald Trump, Paul. Our president is the commander-in-chief of the United States Army. Uh, and so, uh, you know, if, if the general says go, what do the troops do? They go, right? So think of God, God as the commander-in-chief. 
Pero his, his army is blessings. His soldiers and troops are blessings. And he sends them to go and bless God's people. He sends them to bless God's people. And so this unity and being with God's people is considered a blessing, po. It's not a curse to be here, po. Some people think it's a curse to go to church. It's not, okay? Uh, some people think, I don't want to see that person. I don't want to talk to him. I don't want to talk to her. And so it feels like a curse. No, no, it is not a curse. It is a blessing. It says, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, what? Life forever or eternal life. And that's very strange, Paul. It's, it seems like he's talking about salvation, but he, he, he's not talking about salvation per se, Paul. It is in fellowship, God satisfies the longing for eternal life. In other words, fellowship is like a picture of heaven. I will say that again. Fellowship in the church is like heaven. It pictures heaven. Who wants to go to heaven? Okay, you should all raise your hands, okay? You should all raise your hands because everyone wants to go to heaven. When we see this and we experience unity with God's people, it is a small taste of heaven. A small taste. Sample, only a, only a sample of heaven. You would be a fool not to want heaven, Right? You would be a fool not to want heaven because it pictures the harmonious fellowship that we will be with. So, um, you know, the reason why people struggle with going to church, Paul, is because they feel like it does not look like heaven. See, Pastor Micah, you say it looks like heaven, but when I go to, to GFC, it doesn't look like heaven, Paul. It looks like the other place. It's like, okay, I, I agree. You know, there's still sin. We still struggle with a lot of things, and it's very hard. Life is hard. It may not look like heaven now. It is your responsibility, Paul, to make it look like heaven. It's not our responsibility to run away. It's our responsibility to help our church to look more and more like heaven. Not just the responsibility of the pastor slang, Paul. But every church member must make the fellowship of the church like heaven. Um, and uh, we should do whatever it takes to be in this fellowship. The Jewish pilgrims would walk miles and miles to get to the feast, feast on foot. You know what we say? Oh, no. It's, it's, it's sprinkling, but I can't go to church. Oh, Meron ubo, oh, and cough, oh, oh, I can't, I can't go to church, po. Uh, we, 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 church, we can make excuse after excuse after excuse. This excuses are forever. We can find any excuse not to be here. But the one excuse, or the one reason why we should be here is because this is where we get a taste of heaven. Did you know Jesus prayed for us to be united? Did you know Jesus prayed for us to be together? John chapter 17, I think I have it here. John chapter 17, verses 22 to 23 says this, Paul. The glory, this is Jesus praying. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they, us, may be one, just as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity. So that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you have loved me. Loved ones, we have been saved for a purpose, Paul. We have been saved to be united together to Jesus Christ. And we are, we are united. We are here to serve one another, to exercise our gifts towards one another. And we are also saved for another purpose, an evangelistic purpose. It says that they may be perfect in un, un, perfected in unity so that the world may know that you sent me. We are supposed to be united together so that the world would know that we are all in Christ, that they would come to Christ. And so for the unbelievers, if you do not know Christ here today, Paul, 
uh, union with Christ is available. Jesus Christ came. He died 2,000 years ago. He rose from the dead. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. If you trust in Him and believe in Him and repent of your sins, you can have also life eternal. And you will be united with us forever. Beloved, get used to each other, beloved. Why? Bakit po? Because we will see each other every single day in eternity. And so we better be united now. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for the unity that we have in Jesus Christ. Lord, we do not deserve your love. Forgive us, but when we are disunited, we sin against one another, we are selfish, we are using our own selfish needs above others, and we do not serve one another as you have called us to serve. Father, help us, Lord. It is, it is hard to preserve and protect unity. But, oh Lord, you will help us to protect it. The gospel will succeed. The gospel will thrive. And the gates of Hades will not prevail over the church. And we are so thankful, Lord. Bless the rest of our evening in our fellowship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Salamat po.